Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. Well, this past Wednesday was a big day. What was it? Only one person? Right, first day of spring, Wednesday, March 20th, at exactly 5.58 p.m., the sun was directly over the equator, meaning the entire earth had exactly the same amount of sunlight and darkness for that day. It's called the vernal equinox, and then every day from that point on, our days get longer, so this is a good time of the year. Now, personally, I have to say, just a little confession here, that for me, March is the most disappointing month of the year. It's disappointing. I mean, I expect January and February to be dark and cold and gloomy, but then comes March, and, and the first day of spring, and baseball spring training starts, and spring break. How many students just started spring break? Awesome time, right? Spring break. And I get my hopes up, no matter how much I try not to, I get my hopes up, and it's just March. <laughs> now, we like to complain about weather, living here in Illinois as we do, but um, it could be worse. Have you ever heard of a town called Barrow, Alaska? Barrow, Alaska is located 320 miles north of the Arctic Circle, the northernmost point of the U.S. It's actually now called by a different name. It's called Utkiavik from the indigenous language of the people who live there. But it's one of the darkest places on earth. For a stretch of 67 consecutive days each winter, the sun never rises above the horizon. It looks like that for over two months. Like, Why would you live there? But it's not the darkest place on earth. Uh, that title goes to a village in Norway called Rukin. That's not only very far north, but it's ne- nestled between mountains. So that even when the sun is above the horizon, the rays can't get to this town. And for six months every year, those people do not see the sun, even one time. It's so dark for so long that a few years ago, engineers built three huge mirrors. I'm not making this up. You can look it up. They built giant mirrors and put them up in the mountain to reflect the sun down into the valley to the village. So at least those people can see the sun's rays. Now, today we're going to talk about a different kind of darkness and a different kind of light. We're in a series called Jesus in the Prophets. And we're looking at these prophecies given to the ancient people of Israel that point to God's promise of a Messiah. One who would come to deliver and redeem and save his people. That we as Christians believe also point us to Jesus himself as the fulfillment of that promise. And so far we've seen several themes emerge in this series. Uh, The prophet Micah, where we started, pointed to Jesus as the promised king who would also be a shepherd, who would rule and care for his people. Hosea pointed to Jesus as the faithful bridegroom to an unfaithful bride. Last week, we looked at Zechariah, who envisioned a kind of courtroom scene where Jesus is our advocate, who defends us against our accuser. Now, today, we look at two themes, light and government. You'll pick that up as we go along. Now, a little background. Isaiah lived in the 8th century B.C., so that's in the 700s. Um, And during that time, the nation of Israel was divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom called Israel and the southern kingdom called Judah. And a couple of weeks ago, I tried to have you visualize that by thinking about Wisconsin and Illinois and then Canada as the enemy. Uh, But today, I actually have a real map. So take a look at this map of the ancient world. You'll see way to the north there in the beige, it says the Syrian Empire. So the Assyrians were up there. They were sort of the aggressive enemy of the people of Israel. The blue area is the northern kingdom. And then the the mustard-colored area is the southern kingdom where where Jerusalem is. And so um, as the Assyrian Empire grew and began to press down, uh, they took the northern kingdom first in 722 B.C. uh, with a king named Shalmaneser V. You can look him up in secular history books. And then... Another hundred years go by or so, and then uh, Babylon takes the place of Assyria, and they come and they swoop down and they take the southern kingdom in 586 B.C. You can also read about that. Uh, That was during the time of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and if you read uh, the book of Daniel, Daniel and the lion's den, that took place roughly during that time as well. So Isaiah's ministry as prophet began just before the fall of the northern kingdom. He actually refers to that in the passage you're going to look at today, and then he keeps 
delivering his prophecies to the southern kingdom, warning the kings and the people that continued disobedience will lead to the same fate in the south as happened to the north, and all of that actually came to be. Isaiah chapter 8 ends with this verse, verse 22. Then they will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom, and they will be thrust into utter darkness. Now, Isaiah here is speaking to a real historical and spiritual situation. He's warning the ancient people that Babylon and Assyria are coming. But in the larger, longer horizon of prophecy, it also speaks to us today because our world today is still filled with darkness, distress, and gloom. Just last week, we saw the tragic mass shooting in New Zealand. 50 people dead, 50 wounded, shootings in mosques in Christ Church, New Zealand. It almost got no attention, but at that same time, that same week, almost the same day, 40 Christians were murdered by jihadist extremists in Nigeria. Hardly got any play at all. War, terrorism, racial conflict, domestic violence, poverty, addiction, depression. And that's not even thinking about whatever manner of personal darkness and stress and gloom might have pressed in on you or your family. Just on Friday, I was the on-call chaplain at the hospital right here, next, almost next door. And I was called to pray with a young husband and wife who lost a baby at 35 weeks. And you could just feel the sadness, gloom, darkness. So Isaiah could be writing today. So I'm going to read for you Isaiah chapter 9, the first seven verses, and we'll comment a little bit, and then we'll look at what the prophecy is telling us. He writes, nevertheless, even though the, dark, the world is in darkness, even though people are in gloom, nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by way of the sea beyond the Jordan. I'm going to pause there for a moment. There's a couple things here that happen right away that you might not notice if I don't mention them. Zebulun and Naphtali were two of the northernmost tribes of Israel. So they were the first, among the first to fall as Assyria came swooping down from the north. That makes sense. Prophets like Amos and Hosea had predicted this, and it actually took place. Isaiah's then saying that one day, all of this will change. And he gives us a hint, the first hint that he's pointing toward Jesus. I wonder if you saw it in those words I read. He says, in the future he will honor Galilee of the nations by way of the sea beyond the Jordan. Where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. Bethlehem is in the south near Jerusalem. But where was Jesus raised, his home base? In Nazareth, that's in Galilee in the north. And Galilee is where Jesus first declared himself to be the fulfillment of these ancient prophecies. So this is the first hint we see that the prophet is talking about the one who would come. Verse 2, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light, and those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For you have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Now, you recognized part of that text. We usually hear it read at Christmas time. Uh, we send cards to each other that have these verses written on them. I don't know if we have, we have that right up there. We did a whole series on these names of the Messiah back in December, but the situation Isaiah is writing into is, is not a very Christmassy time at all. The land and the people, he says, are enveloped in deep darkness. Now, in the Old Testament, darkness was a metaphor for hopelessness, for fear, for disobedience, and for idolatry. 
Uh, One translation says they were living in the shadow of death. Isaiah is saying that to these people, to this land, a light has dawned. And that's the first thing we see, a light has dawned. Back in my uh, youth ministry days, I often took students on mission trips to the Dominican Republic. Uh, Here's one of my favorite pictures from those days. Little Where's Waldo, see if you can find me in the picture. Swarthy looking young guy down there. How many students, by the way, this summer are going on a mission trip? I've signed up to go. Anybody here going? I hope you get a chance to do these things uh, because they're extraordinary experiences. And if you can't go this summer and you're a student, I hope you get a chance to go in the future and serve somewhere because these are amazing times of growth. Now, it was common in the Dominican Republic at that time to have rolling blackouts around the country, meaning their electrical grid couldn't support the whole country all at once, so they would just, parts of the country would go dark throughout the day. Parts of the city would go dark. It was unpredictable. You didn't know what was going to happen. And when it would happen, the Dominicans had a simple phrase for it. In Spanish, they would say, no hay luz. Literally, there is no light. No hay luz. No hay luz. It meant there was no power. And so we were doing a project, working on an orphanage, and it was physical, and it was uh, mixing cement and so forth. So we learned to look for the, elect- the single uh, light bulb that was on the outside of the building where we, where we ate our meals and where we took our showers and where we stayed at night. So we'd be trudging back from the work site, uh, dirty and sweaty, and if that light was off, our spirits would just sag because it meant there was no power. And if there's no power, that meant there was no showers because were, the water pumps wouldn't work and there was no running water. And it meant another night just sleeping in your own grime. But if that light was on, and one day I remember we were walking back, all the lights, lights had been off all day long, we had been working all day long, we we're trudging back expecting no showers, another grungy night, and that light bulb popped on. The light came on, and we immediately began to, to yell, loose, loose, there's light. And we began to run toward the light because it meant there were showers. And showers, of course, meant great joy. Look at verse 2 here. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them. The bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. Isaiah is saying that the promised Messiah would bring light to darkness in three ways. First, he will enlarge the nation. Now, remember in Old Testament prophecy, there are three contexts or horizons of meaning. In the immediate historical situation, Enlarge the nation means that the people who had been in captivity are still coming home to Jerusalem. It means that the population of Jerusalem is literally growing day by day. But in the wider context, it points backward to the fulfillment of the promise given to Abraham way back in Genesis chapter 12. I will make you into a great nation, God said. I will bless you, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And then in the future context... Stretching all the way to where we live today, it's looking toward the spread of salvation, of God's salvation, the spread of the gospel to the whole world, including the Gentile, non-Jewish world, which is us. Did you know that right now the gospel is growing faster around the world than at any time in history? Now, we don't see it here in North America because it's not happening here in North America. There are churches that are growing, and we happen to be one of them here at Chapel Street. But in other places of the world, continents like Asia, Africa, South America, Christianity is growing at a rate seven times greater than population growth. It's exploding around the world. I'll tell you a little bit more about why in a little bit, but it means that prophecy given to Isaiah 2,700 years ago is being fulfilled in our lifetimes today. Secondly, he says he will increase their joy. And then he gives two interesting illustrations of joy. He says, like joy at harvest time. How many farmers we have here? Anybody grow up on a farm? Okay. I think farmers would understand this, but most of us aren't farmers. In that day, the harvest was the wealth of a community. 
The harvest was their wealth. It was the very blessing and provision of God. It would be for us like the joy you might feel when at the end of a work year, you get that bonus check. The blessing of God himself. Then he says, like joy soldiers feel at winning a battle. And he mentions Midian's defeat. That's referring to Judges chapter 7 when Gideon took this small band of 300 warriors. They were huge underdogs in a battle against Midian, but they won the battle because God enabled them to win the battle. Now, if, he were, if, if Isaiah were writing today, he might be talking about a different analogy. Like, anybody here watching March Madness? Okay, we watch. It's kind of a fun thing. How's your favorite team doing? Your favorite team still in? Well, maybe not. But it's, a, it's like having your favorite team uh, go to the final game, and then they win the final game on a buzzer-beating shot, and the the, the student section just erupts and races on the floor, just unbridled joy at victory. That's what he's talking about. He will increase your joy. And thirdly, he says, he will shatter the yoke that burdens them. The immediate historical con- context is decades and decades of physical and spiritual captivity. Assyria. And Babylon, Isaiah here is saying that they will, you will one day, those captives one day will be set free. And that took place like 200 years later in 536 B.C. when Cyrus the Great of Persia took over from Babylon and he decided to let the Jews go, to let them go back home and rebuild Jerusalem. In the future of this prophecy, the future context, it points to freedom of a different kind. Freedom from the ultimate burden, the ultimate captivity of sin and death. Now, why do we think he's pointing us to Jesus, these, this ancient prophecy? Now, if we jump ahead to the New Testament, we see that the Messiah will bring light. John chapter 1, we read, in him, that's talking about Jesus, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Verse 9, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. How about joy? In John 15, Jesus himself said, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. The Gospel of Matthew makes it exceedingly clear. Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus heard that John, that's John the Baptist, had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Remember, that's in the north. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. The people living in darkness have seen a great light, and those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. So Isaiah says a great light is coming into the darkness of the world, and now he tells us that light is a person. That's the second thing we see is that a son is given. A son is given. When our youngest son was born, it had been a long and difficult process as many uh, birth stories are, and there, was even, there were even a few moments of real uh, fear and anxiety because the baby was in distress at some point. But just after our son was born and everything appeared to be healthy, um, my, my wife and I are both have tears running down our face, tears of joy. We're so glad, so relieved. And I looked down at our doctor, who happened to be Dr. James Lee, he's part of our Chapel Street family, he delivered three of our sons. He's delivered hundreds and hundreds of babies. And I looked at James, and tears are coming down his face too. He looked at me, I looked at him, and he said, and I'll never forget what he said, he said, everyone's a miracle, he said. And it's true. The birth of a child is universally experienced as a gift, but the birth of this child is unique. Verse 6 says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Notice, not just born, but given. Given to us. Who is the us in the story? Who is the us Isaiah is thinking about? The immediate context, us is the nation of Israel. How can a child be born to a nation? He continues, and the government will be on his shoulders. That's a new theme for us, government. I want you to notice in this next couple of verses how many times the words refer to government and or authority. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. 
Now, the historical situation Isaiah is speaking to is that government had failed miserably. The kings of Israel and the kings of Judah had disobeyed God and had failed the nation. God had spoken, made his covenant and his expectations quite clear through his law. But the kings had disregarded God's law. The prophets had come and warned them to return, repent, turn back to God. And the kings had continued to disregard. And so judgment came in the form of Assyria and Babylon, and the nation was carried into captivity, darkness. But the prophet says one is coming who will restore what is broken, and the government will be on his shoulders because human governments have failed. Human government is inadequate. Human government cannot bring justice and righteousness, not the way God can. Now let me pause here for a second. Do you think that's still true today? That human governments fail in bringing the justice and righteousness of God? We see this around us every day. And we live in one of the greatest societies on the face of the earth. And we see it every day. Isaiah says, one who is coming, who will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, these are more than names. These are messianic titles. So why do we think they're pointing to Jesus? We did a series on this back in the fall. You can go back and check it out. But let me just summarize. Jesus is the wonderful counselor. Wonderful means miraculous. He's our miraculous counselor. How? By his miraculous birth. He's the incarnation of God himself through his miracles of healing, through his miracle of forgiveness, through the miracle of resurrection. He's our counselor through his teaching, by his word, and through the Holy Spirit he promised to give us, to live in us and guide us. He's our miraculous counselor. Jesus is also our mighty God. Mighty is a word that means warrior, one powerful enough to defeat all our enemies. Jesus is the power of God to defeat the ultimate enemies of sin and death. The Apostle Paul says he made a public spectacle of our enemies, triumphing over them in the cross. He's mighty enough to save. Jesus is our everlasting Father. This is interesting because usually we think of Jesus as being the Son, and he is. But he also said, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And what he presents to us is a relationship with our Father, but not a Father who's forever critical, who forever expects more, who is absent, or one who is abusive, or one who is angry, but the Father who is present, available, whose love is unconditional and unending, everlasting, everlasting Father. And then Jesus is our Prince of Peace, Because Jesus offers peace with God, peace with each other, and peace about our eternal destiny. A pastor in New York City named Tim Keller says there are three things every human being needs. No matter when in history you live, no matter what culture you live in, what language you speak, every human being needs three things. First, to be able to face death. It's the one thing we all have in common. I did a small funeral yesterday in Wheaton. Hardly a month goes by when I'm not or Jeff's not or some, one of us is not standing next to an open grave or a casket with a grieving family. And almost every time I do, I realize that's going to be me someday. It's one thing we all have in common. We all need to know how to face death. Secondly, we all need to be able to live with our past and our failures, our regrets. Some of you came in here today carrying a big invisible backpack full, heavy of regrets, mistakes. We all have have a way to deal with that. Someone to help carry those, take them away. And we all need to learn to forgive our enemies. Because if we can't forgive those who sinned against us, we are just bitter people. Human governments, economic systems, Better education can all accomplish amazing things in the world, but can't touch any any of those three things. They can't touch any of them. Only one person can help with all three. Jesus promises eternal life. He's mighty enough to defeat death. Jesus offers 
peace with the past because he nails our sins to the cross, carries them away, and he enables us to forgive because once we experience his grace, we can offer that grace to others. And that's why the gospel is exploding around the world today. Those three things. Because where human governments fail, and they all fall short, where human governments are corrupt, where education and resources and services are inadequate or sorely lacking, Jesus reigns, the prophet says. Jesus brings light to darkness. He brings forgiveness to sin. He brings life to death. He brings hope to despair. He reigns. That's what the prophet's talking about when he says he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. A son is given. And the last thing we see in the prophecy is the zeal of the Lord. The zeal of the Lord. Uh, any fans of the TV drama, This Is Us here? Anybody watch This Is Us? Okay, so you willingly submit yourself to having your heart ripped out every Tuesday night? Okay, even if you don't watch the show, you'll get this little illustration. This whole show revolves around the character of husband and father, Jack Pearson. Jack's quite a guy. Or rather, it revolves around his tragic death, right? Uh, there's a faulty kitchen appliance. It starts a fire at night. Jack wakes up, realizes the whole house is aflame. His family's in danger, so he runs around the house and rescuing everybody. Gets, gets his three kids out, gets his wife out safely, and then realizes once he's got them all out that his daughter's little pet dog is still in the house. And you're thinking, no, no, don't run, don't run back in. But he runs back in because he loves his daughter. And in the process, he inhales enough smoke that eventually it costs him his life. So Jack is the tragic hero of the story. And if you watch, you know that even though he died like a long time ago, he's still in every episode. <laughs> but there's, a, there's sort of a biblical thing there. If you pay attention, here's what the prophet's saying. The world is mired in darkness, hopelessness. It was 2,700 years ago, and it still is today. And your life, my life, our lives are touched by this darkness because we live in it. It touches us and stains us. It might be regret. It might be loss. It might be pain. But there's a promise, the prophet says. A son is given. The son is our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, our everlasting father, our prince of peace. The son will bring light and hope and salvation. He'll reign forever. But it's easy to miss this last line. He says, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Zeal in the ancient language is kind of an interesting word. It's unusual. It means ardor or burning passion. It's a kind of ferocity of love. It's a word you would use to describe a father running into a burning home to rescue a child. It's a word you would use to describe a mother staying up all night long with a sick child, night after night. It's the love of the God of the universe looking down on all he's created in love, on the people he made in his own image, and then rushing headlong into the darkness and pain and brokenness and sin of this world in the person of his son to rescue and to save. And this is the son that was given, knowing full well what the cross would cost him, yet going willingly to bear the burden of not only my particular sins, not only your personal particular sins, but the collective weight of all of our sins in this room and all the sins that people live in this state and all the people who've ever lived on the face of the earth in the course of human history. All of them piled up in him at once. This is what zeal means. And why would he do it? To set free. To set free from our enemy, free from our past, free from the fear of death, to increase our joy. So what is the zeal of the Lord Almighty? What is the burning passion of God? Here's the thing, you are. It's you. Your darkness, your fears, your regrets, your pains. See, our greatest problems are not political in nature. Our greatest problems are not financial. They aren't solved by an election, or they aren't solved by having more money. They aren't solved by having more stuff or getting another degree. Our greatest problems are spiritual at their core. 
sin, death, forgiveness, marriage, family. They're all spiritual at their core. We don't have in ourselves the wisdom, the power, the authority, the resources to solve these problems ourselves. We don't. Governments don't have the wisdom, the power, or the resources. Universities don't have the wisdom, power, and resources to solve. But the prophet says there is one who does. He is the son who is given. He is the one who sets free. He is the one who increases our joy. He's the one who promises life. His name is Jesus. Will you bow with me as we close today? Lord God, we thank you today for your word, for the mystery and power and promise of these ancient prophetic books. They're strange to our ears sometimes, and we, we sometimes avoid reading them because we don't think we're going to understand. But we thank you for not abandoning us to the darkness and pain that we see around us every day. Thank you for the light and hope we have in the one who is mighty enough to defeat even our greatest enemies. So thank you for your zealous and endless love for each one of us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.